Hello everyone! Today I am going to tell you about an element which in my opinion is the most colorful one and which is one of the most essential microelements in our organism. Today we will talk about iodine. I think many of you know that seaweed is rich of iodine as well as other seafood. High concentration of iodine in sea waters and in sea organisms led to the discovery of this element in the beginning of the 19th century. By the way, when writing the script for this video, I wondered why there is so much iodine in seaweed and what role it plays in these plants. The answer to this question stunned me. According to the research conducted in 2008, lots of types of seaweed use iodine containing inorganic chemicals, for instance such as iodides, to protect themselves from atmospheric ozone in low tides, a small amount of which is present in the air. Iodide ions in the cells of seaweed react with nitrogen in the air forming aerosol from small particles of elemental iodine, which is oxidized by ozone in the air and then dissolves in water. Thus seaweeds have adapted to the damaging effect of ozone, which is formed within close proximity to water. Iodine was discovered, as you might have guessed, in seaweed. For instance, if to take such a rich of iodine seaweed as combo or wakame and burn it at a high temperature and then add a sulfuric acid to this ash, a small amount of violet iodine vapors will be released. This is how elemental iodine was extracted for the first time ever. However, today, during the era of globalization, iodine is no longer extracted from seaweed because doing so is not very cost efficient. Nowadays iodine is extracted from ancient ground waters or from so-called potassium ores. It is very easy to extract iodine from potassium iodide. We just need to take some potassium iodide and dissolve it in water. Fortunately, potassium iodide is highly soluble in water. If to add an oxidizer to this solution, for instance potassium iodide, there will be released a small amount of elemental iodine. Pure elemental iodine is a dark hard chemical, which has turned into such beautiful crystals. In 20 years in this old jar, most probably this happened because of the sunlight or another source of heat, which partly sublimed the iodine, and such stunning dark crystals grow out of it. Elemental iodine is quite fragile. These crystals are very easy to break with pincers. Which is why small pieces, little by little sublime, dine everything around in dark iodine stains. By the way, speaking of sublimation, elemental iodine has an interesting property. It easily transitions to gaseous state and forms beautiful violet iodine vapors. Let us run an experiment. I am putting small iodine crystals into a glass and cover the glass with a rounded glass flask filled with ice cold water. I am heating up the glass or a stove, which is why iodine is quickly subliming, that is, transitioning from a solid state to a gaseous state, skipping the liquid state. Upon reaching 114 degrees Celsius, it starts melting and quickly vaporizing. Iodine boils at the temperature of 118 degrees Celsius. If the temperature of the stove is right, on the bottom of the glass we can see a whole liquid iodine waterfall. Its vapors rise up, but upon cooling, immediately condense in the lower parts of the glass. On the top we can see thin iodine crystals grow downwards. Their shapes differ from the crystals in the jar, which grow at a slower pace. Apparently the pace at which crystals grow affects their crystalline grids. And also keep in mind that these iodine vapors are quite toxic. This experiment should be done in a fume hood. I let the glass cool for about 2 hours. After that I decided to check on crystals. They grew 3 times their initial length. And now I have highly pure iodine without any inclusions. Iodine crystals can also be used to produce liquid iodine, and it doesn't take much to do that. We just need to melt a piece of iodine in a test tube and then just pour out the liquid iodine in the some container. I did that to show you elemental iodine in a liquid state. 
which is rarely seen because of the precise temperature of just 66 degrees Celsius, at which iodine can be liquid in normal conditions. I think this is the reason why there is a myth that iodine doesn't exist in the liquid state, but rather it sublimizes and forms vapor. Iodine's property to easy vaporize can be applied in forestic science. If to take some iodine tincture and add 2 teaspoons of 3% hydrogen peroxide and a quarter spoon of citric acid to it, in some time there will be released a small amount of elemental iodine. If to carefully turn the glass upside down and put it on a sheet of paper with a fingerprint, in some time you'll see the fingerprint. That's because iodine dissolves well in fat, which we leave along with our fingerprints. Speaking of the solid state of iodine, it doesn't dissolve well in water. However, it dissolves well in nonpolar solvent, for instance in alcohol or hexane. I think you know that it dissolves well in alcohol, because you can find tincture of iodine practically in any Russian pharmacy. However, it is not sold as simple iodine dissolved in ethanol, rather it is a mixture of potassium iodide, because it contains triiodide ions, which help make iodine more soluble in alcoholic solution. Such iodine tincture can be used to make another organic chemical, which is iodoform. We just need to add 10% sodium hydroxide solution to a few milliliters of iodine tincture. A few seconds later, the solution will become colorless, and there will be forming yellowish crystals of iodoform. In mixtures with fillers, such as glycerol and zinc oxide, iodoform is successfully used in dentistry as antiseptic paste. Also, we can run an interesting experiment with different solubilities of iodine. First, we need to pour chloroform into a graduated cylinder, because it is heavier liquid. Then we need to add water and to top it with hexane. If we add a few crystals of iodine to these three layers of liquids, we can see this element dissolve in different layers of the liquids. The lower iodoform layer becomes dark violet, the middle layer is slightly yellow and the top layer is pink. Judging by the color, we can conclude that iodine dissolved best in the lower chloroform layer, a bit worse in the hexane layer and almost didn't dissolve in water. However, if to use sodium disulfate instead of water, iodine crystals will dissolve well in such a solution. Also, this is a reduction of iodine to sodium iodide rather than dissolving, and sodium disulfate will be oxidizing. However, we are not done with running experiments with iodine yet. It's time to demonstrate a classical reaction with this element, which is a reaction of iodine with aluminum. I have reduced a few crystals of iodine to powder in a mortar to make the reaction run faster. Now I am mixing iodine with aluminum powder, which is a very fitting for this reaction, because this is a very fine powder. To start with, I am going to add a few drops of water, and in just a few seconds, the mixture will self-ignite. In this reaction, as well as in many other reactions with iodine, there forms a cloud of iodine vapor, which is so hard to stop looking at, even for experienced chemists. By the way, a small portion of this cloud settled on the hood's walls, leaving striking strains. But that's ok, because just a few hours later such stains disappear on their own, because of elemental iodine's high volatility. We haven't finished obtaining iodine clouds yet. If you remember a TV program on Discovery called Brainiac from about 12 years ago, you must remember the Logan's paste. To make that paste, you just need to mix small crystals of iodine with ammonia solution. About 50 minutes later, there forms nitrogen triiodide, which consists of unstable molecules. When it's wet, it's quite safe, but when it is dry, it's a very unstable chemical. 
after filtration, we leave the filler with nitrogen trioidate dry overnight in the laboratory. I strongly recommend you not to try this experiment at home, because it's very dangerous experiment. Now, when the paste is dry, it's time to demonstrate how unstable it is. It's enough to touch the dried nitrogen trioidate with a thin stick. Well, I did. The explosion was extremely loud, and during this fast reaction, nitrogen triiodide split into gaseous nitrogen and elemental iodine, which also forms such a violet cloud. This cloud of iodine is also very toxic, that is why you should not repeat this experiment. However, elemental iodine is quite stable and doesn't oxidize when exposed to the air. If to run experiments not with elemental iodine, but with its oxide, the reaction will get much more interesting. The thing is, if you heat up iodine oxide, it will split into oxygen and elemental iodine, forming those beautiful violet fumes. If we add water to the iodine oxide, there will form iodine acid, which can dissolve some active metals, such as magnesium, for instance. In this reaction, magnesium forms magnesium iodide, and also there forms some elemental iodine. Iodine oxide is also actively reacts with iron. The reaction runs when the mixture is set on fire. Just like it is the case with other reactions, during this experiment there forms vapors of elemental iodine. In slow motion, we can see that these fumes look stunning. Speaking of the physiological properties of iodine, this element is essential for our thyroid gland because it produces hormones regulating metabolism, such as tyroxine and triiodotyronine. That is the reason why people not living within close proximity to the seas and oceans try to consume iodized salt, which is rich of potassium iodate, in order for people to be able to reduce a deficit of iodine. I think now I can end the video about this non-metal with the heaviest atomic mass at this point. If you want to learn even more, I suggest that you watch other videos on my channel related to this element. And also if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting.